In our next module, we're going to begin discussing programmability concepts. So for an agenda, we're going to discuss general programmability concepts. We're going to talk about what even is an API, what is Python, what is REST, what is JSON, what is JSON RPC, and what is XML. So let's start out with programmability concepts. So when we're talking about programmability, we have to keep in mind there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle, right? The idea is that we want to be able to provide a way of dealing with a piece of hardware or software in a repeatable, uh, predictable way. We can use a lot of different environments to uh, do our programming on, whether it's Linux, whether it's Mac, whether it's Windows. Everyone has their own camp, their own preferences, uh, but it really doesn't matter too much. We can use different languages to approach this. We could use Python or Go. We could use Ruby. We could use um, C++. We could use C Sharp. We could use Java. We could, you know, we could use assembly <laughs> if we really wanted to. Maybe not what we're wanting to do here. But the idea is there's a lot of different languages that we can use. Um, some are compiled, meaning that when we're done creating the code like C++ or C, that we actually have to run it through something called a compiler that creates a binary uh, image. This is typically done for a few reasons. One, uh, we don't want necessarily people to see our source code and reverse engineer or uh, try to you know, steal our intellectual property. It's also done for faster runtime uh, production. Okay? Um, many of the languages, in fact, anything that we're going to be dealing with, most notably would be Python, uh, things like Go, things like Ruby, these are all scripted languages. So they are a programming language. We are creating a program, um, but they are essentially runtime compiled. So that is, they, they compile themselves when we actually execute the program and they, they run at that state then. Uh, but they're kept in, in essentially flat files, in essentially uh, ASCII text readable human source code. Then we have this concept of an API or an application programming interface. And this isn't a language. It's not a type of data. It is a way to interact between systems or between pieces of software. So some software talking to other software, they're going to interact with some, some form of an API. And we'll talk a lot about one particular form called REST. And that is a, a very well-structured, um, most applications on the internet today use REST, which uses HTTP. And we'll talk a, a lot more about that. But that's one main API that we'll be focusing on. There is also different types of ways that we can structure and pass data back and forth in a serial format. So if I'm sending a lot of data, uh, you know, line after line after line of ASCII text, whether it's encrypted or not, you know, using HTTPS or TLS, SSL, uh, that's really no matter. But the idea is that whether it's encrypted and gets decrypted or not, um, on either side, we're passing just serial text, okay, ASCII characters. And we can use things like XML or JSON, and we'll talk a lot more about those as well. So, one of the things we'll talk about in programmability concepts is, and sorry for the overlap there, it's actually kind of left over from the last slide. Let me see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Is CLI scraping. So the idea behind CLI scraping is that essentially if we have a network type device that doesn't have an API, doesn't have a well-structured way to interact with it, we may have to go in just like a human would, but we try to automate this through a program. So for instance, I may uh, go in and instead of running a command that you know, I know would do the exact same thing every time, I would SSH or God forbid Telnet in and I would actually um, you know, run a command on the command line. Well, I can automate programs to do this, but 
it's not always predictive exactly what's going to come back, right? So a human can interact with this very easily, right? If I do a show uh, interface brief and I can visually look down the page and see, oh, okay, this interface is up, up, this interface is up, down, and I know how to interact with that because I'm a human, right? But if I do that as a computer then, or a, a program, then I have to scrape all that information, I have to kind of piece it apart and look for one specific piece and I need to know where that is in relation to another piece. So for instance, up down, where is that in relation to which interface? If I do a show IP interface brief, it may not be, um, you know, I may have 20 interfaces or 200 interfaces and I need to know which the up down is in relation to. Is it interface 1, 20, or 38? Okay, so I have to kind of scrape everything off of the screen and piece it apart and put it in sections and then kind of put it back together. So I can't just easily say, how does interface E120 look, right? Because uh, I'm just getting it from the screen and I'm kind of having to do, with, from a computer standpoint or from a, an application standpoint, what a human would do. So this is where, uh, this is really how 70% of automated configuration management's done today. Again, either a human does it, or if I've automated it, I have created very kind of complex programs um, to, uh, to do things. Um, one funny note you know, from someone who obviously used to work at Cisco uh, and took over as the CEO of Arista, uh, created, you know, they said it's the, the way real men build networks today. Uh, a bit of tongue in cheek there, obviously, but the idea is that this is task oriented, right? So each task is oriented into itself. It's human friendly. It's easy to replay and get the same information out. Doesn't require any special tools, but it's not friendly to software at all. If something changes in the way syntax or the formatting of things are exported, then I have to rewrite my automation code to look at the new type of format. Um, there's no common data model, which you may or may not know what that is, and we'll talk more about that later. And there's no real error reporting. I basically uh, Telnet or SSH in, and one of the old tools that we would use was called the expect language. I would basically issue a command, and then I would tell the program what I expect to see. The problem was, sometimes you don't know what to expect. And so you have to write all of these, okay, if I see this, then do this. If not, or, or if else, if I see something else, then do this. Or if else, then see this. Or if else, then do this. Or if else, then do this. And there might not just be five, like I just kind of rattled off, your main if and then your four if else, um, or l if, you know, your else if I see this, else if I see this. Uh, there might be 20. And that might not even account for all that you might possibly see in the future or that might be introduced in the future. The problem is it's very difficult to, ex to know what to expect. So whether you're using expect or whether you're using a tool like, um, and I'm not sure why this is actually just kind of blending together. So I apologize for that. I'll try to get this fixed here in a moment. Um, whether I'm using a tool like like Paramico, which is a, just happens to be one Python module that you can add. Uh, again, we're just introducing kind of a lot of high level concepts. These are by no means the only things that you can use. Um, this is just one tool that you could use. So if you're using the Python programming language to do automation, rather than TCL or expect or Perl and expect or whatever else, uh, as I mentioned before, um, you could use Paramico which is a tool that allows SSH functionality and capabilities into your uh, Python program. And I can use this here. We just have a very, very simple uh, sample of code that just gets you connected and that's it. We're not even doing any screen scraping here. So in our more advanced uh, Python for Network Engineers course, we do go into how to use uh, Paramico and Python to do screen scraping when you need to. Okay? That's not going to be the extent of this course. This is just kind of an introduction to DevOps and programmability. But um, we will go into that into the Python for Network Engineers uh, introductory course. So do check that out a little bit later. So what is an API? As we mentioned before, it's an application programming interface. It's an interface for programs to talk to one another. 
Uh, and whether those programs are essentially things residing on a piece of hardware, like a Nexus switch, or a router, or a, you know, we talked about viral earlier, um, as a virtual internet routing lab, any software to software, software to hardware, which is essentially running software, this is just an interface, okay? It's just a way to, uh, it's, it's a common agreed upon language. Think of it that way. So it's a set of requirements that governs how applications can be used by other applications. So what an API does is exposes the internal functions to the outside world, um, but they do it in a very rigid or a very structured format so that I know if I make this call, I know exactly what I'm going to get back. Now I have to do something with that data, but I know what I'm going to get back. I don't have to like sit here and scratch my head and say, well, I hope to expect to see this, but I might not. So I have to say, well, if not, then I'm going to see this, or if not, I'm going to see you know, the whole thing that we just went over. Okay, this is not a new concept. Most applications have an API of some sort. They often use some sort of authentication, either through just a simple username password, through key exchanges, through certificates, through tokens, uh, some sort of authentication. And then communication does often either use some sort of uh, native Java or Python, or it could be over simple HTTP with some sort of serial data format like XML and JSON that we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So why are APIs important to the network? Well, one for modularity. So applications can be built into sub-smaller modules that then can communicate through other modules or communicate with other modules through an API. And we can build these, uh, these kind of libraries of interdependencies, right? So, and not even just interdependencies, but I can use, you know, I can call on a module to execute SSH to a device when I need it without having to rewrite the code for SSH and Paramico every single time I need it. I can just call on the, the function, the module, okay? By abstracting, now this is a, a concept we're gonna talk a lot about in this and any other course, especially with ACI, it goes back to UCS, it goes back to a lot of things. The more I'm able to create abstractions, that is decouple portions from one another and allow them to talk to each other in a modular, interactive fashion, but not necessarily be dependent on one another, I am able to create very flexible uh, types of code that can scale really, really large because I just have all these little libraries or modules that I call on whenever I need that one function, okay? And I can build a lot of those functions into a single module, uh, and sometimes that's a, a very important thing, as you'll see. But by exposing a part of the program's function, external tools, such as cloud-based orchestrators, we call them CMP or cloud management platforms, uh, can be automated within an application or an infrastructure in, and this is the important bit, in a consistent fashion without necessarily the need to understand the device or infrastructure uh, implementation, how to understand all the configuration or all the complexity along with it. And then automation. So APIs are important uh, for the network because they allow uh, for different resources, you know, whether compute, network, virtualization, whatever, uh, to be provisioned in a dynamic fashion. So our APIs are evolving. And they're evolving our interaction with the network operating system. And they're not only interacting, uh, evolving our interaction with the network operating system, but really with the entire cloud operating system, which is a, a much, much, much larger whole than just the network, which is you know, a portion of the infrastructure. Uh, but some types of interactions that we've had for quite some time are like bootstrap, okay? Uh, how to configure through APIs, and then how to extend this. So what's evolving? Uh, we're going from a manual to an automated fashion. We're going from static configuration to dynamic configuration and from generic extensions to very customized, uh, very usable extensions. So why? We want to have greater agility in our environments, in our IT, in our fast IT or our cloud architecture. We want to have much larger scale. We want to reduce cost and we want to ultimately uh, reduce complexity. Again, this doesn't mean that your job is going away because we're reducing complexity. We're changing how this looks. 
and things are getting more complex and we need to reduce that. So the evolution of device interaction. Uh, we go from the traditional, for instance, CLI for bootstrap to things like auto install, smart install, um, power on auto provisioning, and ultimately plug and play. Literally plug it in and it works. And we have that today. Uh, from configuration, from traditional CLI to things like NetConf, uh, JSON RPC, which we'll talk a little bit about, to RESTful APIs, and then to beginning into configuration auto management, uh, with, or automation with Puppet and Chef and Ansible, SaltStack, CF Engine, uh, and getting into larger cloud architectures like OpenStack and Clicker and UCS Director and things like that. So our controllers, our ultimate controllers. And then through extend, extensibility, so things like beginning with Embedded Event Manager, to Onbox Python, which almost every Nexus device, uh, NXOS device has today, to OpenFlow or the 1PK architecture, to uh, L2RS for service providers. So these are the types of things and, and ways that we're evolving today. So what is REST? And by the way, some people spell this capital R, lower E, which is probably the more correct way to do it, uh, and then ST. So this stands for representational state transfer. It's a true architectural style for designing networked applications. Okay? And I don't mean networks. Okay? It's not in any way related to networking. In, that's obviously the focus of this particular course. Uh, but when I just say networked, I just simply mean applications, software that happen to be networked together, right? which everything is. We have this big, awesome network called the internet. right? So, uh, so anything that is connected through any other sort of uh, network, typically probably a TCP IP stack, but doesn't necessarily even have to be. So this uses HTTPS. Don't ever use HTTP. I wouldn't even in a test environment, but that's OK. Um, technically, you could, but you always want that encryption, especially because you're going to be authenticating. And you're going to be authenticating with many times devices that uh, you're going to be using either uh, you will either be using a authentication user ID or token or certificate that gives you full root level access, full super user, full admin access, whatever you want to call it, or you could be using that type of a user. And the point is, is that whether you know how to or not uh, doesn't necessarily matter because there are people that do know how to interact with these APIs or can figure it out because all the documentation is freely available on Cisco.com and anywhere else that you can get RESTful API interaction. And if we have that kind of level of access, um, we can do just about anything. Uh, completely wipe out configs, add new configs, change anything. So we want to make sure that you're always, always using uh, SSL or more correctly stated TLS 1.2, uh, which is really the evolution of SSL 3. It would you know, loosely be basically 3.2, okay? But TLS, uh, or Transparent Layer Security, 1.2, okay? So definitely use HTTPS. So that's my spiel on security. I'll get down off my soapbox. Okay, so we're going to operate on resource representations. So the idea is that each representation of a resource, whether it's a network resource, whether it's a software piece, uh, is identified by a separate URL. So for instance, if my resource was a person named Caesar, um, the service, the way that I'm going to contact is through an HTTP GET, and the representation is that I'm going to have, let's say, the name, address, and phone number, and I'm going to pass that serial data in either JSON format, which we'll talk about, or XML format. So REST follows a, a very familiar model, something you're already familiar with. So for instance, from the human side on the left, here's the human, and on the right is the computer or application. So on the left, we see an idea of web browsing, right? We use an HTTP GET, or we launch our web browser, and we point it at cisco.com, and that does an HTTP GET to cisco.com, and it returns HTML, okay? And HTML, your browser knows how to interpret HTML or render it so that your screen displays it in a human readable, human understandable format. We do the same thing from an application, but we tell our application, do an HTTP GET, 
and we tell it the type of format that we want to see back, either JSON or XML, and many uh, software uh, support both, okay? Um, I would say the predominant is JSON. So if I look at all the different RESTful APIs on the web that we'll talk about in a moment, they are, everything supports JSON as a serial data transfer. Some things also support XML. Cisco does typically support JSON and XML in almost all of the products that support a RESTful API. So for instance, here's a REST, here's an application uh, making a call to Twitter, and this looks bad. Uh, <laughs> We'll show you in the hands-on demo portion in the labs how um, REST that looks hard to read, uh, and even sometimes XML that looks hard to read, uh, almost all applications or programming languages like Python, like Ruby, they have this uh, concept of something called pretty print, and we can do this with JSON and with XML as well. Um, so we can pretty print, which basically turns um, a, a long string of data like we see here, into something that's pretty and mainly uh, pleasing and under, quickly visually understandable by a human. The computer doesn't care whether it's in pretty print or not. It's for us when we're creating our code, testing our code, improving our code, and we want to see what we're getting back and what to match on and what to change. Okay, So we'll pretty print things. Uh, but from the computer's perspective, here's a simple JSON uh, where we have uh, essentially what we call a key value pair. The key is IDS or IDs <laughs> and the uh, value, so these pair are the key and the value uh, and the, the key IDS uh, or IDs, the, the value, so colon kind of creating that one for one uh, association, the value is uh, what we would call an array or um, yeah, it depends on what language we're talking about whether it's an array or a uh, you know, uh, list was the word. I was thinking dictionary, but this isn't a dictionary. A list um, or a tuple or a dictionary, different types of arrays, but basically a single value that has multiple values nested within it. So for instance, you know, this number, comma, 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 this number. So essentially um, six values returned, zero through five. Okay, uh, so anyhow, and then we have another key, which is next cursor, the value is zero, the next key, next cursor string, the value zero, the next key, pre previous cursor, zero as an integer or number, and then the next key, previous cursor string as the, uh, as the key, and then the uh, actual string value of what was the integer, which is zero. So anyhow, this is how we'll get a lot more into JSON. So, I apologize for uh, going maybe too deep there just for a moment. But the idea is that we get back data in a way that the application understands, uh, and then we can use that. So it is important to understand that REST, or representational state transfer, is an architectural style. It is not a protocol itself. So we are not using uh, a programming language like Python or Ruby or Go and calling another protocol, we're using an architectural style that everyone's agreed upon, okay? So this was pr first proposed in 2000. It was developed by the W3C in parallel with HTTP 1.0, or sorry, 1.1, and it's a simple CRUD using HTTP. What's, so what's a CRUD? Create, um, create uh, update, and delete. I can't think of what the R is all of a sudden. Uh, create. Uh, read, update, and delete. Sorry, I drew a blank there for a moment. But the idea is that it's a stateless client-server model. So we're basically, uh, think of it almost like UDP. We're, we're making a request, we're hoping to get something back, we're not creating a synchronous connection. Okay? So it's a, it's a stateless connection. Now there are ways to combine that with stateful or uh, with I don't want to say synchronous, but uh, really asynchronous, but also almost like TCP oriented where we have a persistent connection. Older ways of that were things like, um, uh, you may have heard of, I'm thinking of the newer one, but I'm trying to think of the, oh, the older one was like Ajax, the newer one is WebSocket. So there are ways to combine REST with other things that are stateful, but REST in and of itself is stateless. 
And we use URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, or you may incorrectly call them URLs, but to identify the resources of interest to us. And really, as I mentioned before, there are lots of RESTful APIs. So even back in, uh, you know, looking back at like 2009, we had, you know, maybe uh, 118, at least according to this infograph, programmable web uh, had basically said we had 118 social RESTful APIs. In 2013, we had uh, 518, okay? And obviously, now in 2015, 2016, way, way, way more. Um, so this has only exponentially grown over time. Financial-based, back in uh, 09, maybe 89, now 508 uh, financial-based APIs. And we go across the, the the field, enterprise based apps, ma mapping, e commerce, government, science, messaging, payments, telephony. Um, the amount is just growing over and over. And you can go to this website called Programmable Web and you can just search for all the different APIs and you can see how you can interact and build your own programs. So, for instance, I could uh, I could literally build an application that goes out and checks weather.com or I like, I prefer weatherunderground.com and sees where I'm going to have, you know, maybe storms or, you know, hurricanes or typhoons or, uh, you know, earthquakes are a little harder to predict. But I mean, you know, um, actually, anyway, uh, see where these natural disasters may occur and redirect resources to another data center based on weather information. I mean, I can do all sorts of things and post an update to Facebook and Twitter telling all my customers why their application may be a little slower because we moved it away from a data center on the east coast of the US over to Australia or something like that. So their applications may be a little slower, but they're gonna remain up. So I could do all of these with one application. Check the weather, redirect uh, data center web servers and application servers to be re redeployed over in Europe or Australia, and then update Facebook and Twitter all within one app, all through APIs. So, why does this matter for networking? Well, first of all, REST is easy to use. It's human readable, it's friendly to software. Um, we just saw that maybe it's not easy to use, or easy to read, I should say, not easy to use. Uh, easy to read, human readable, but again, I talked about that thing called Pretty Print, which we can talk about and, and show a little bit more in depth. And the idea is that it can be very, very human readable, very easy to read. Um, there's a huge developer base. Um, client libraries exist in many, many, many different languages. So it's not just for the web services, okay? We take a look at um, VMware vCenter Orchestrator or uh, the Realize Orchestrator is what it's called now <clears throat> or the Cisco UCS Director REST API Guide, uh, Cisco uh, XNC RESTful API, uh, Open Daylight has RESTful API. I talked about Viral has a RESTful API. Okay, ACS has a RESTful API. Prime Performance Manager has a RESTful API. Every Nexus device has a RESTful API. Um, iOS, XR, and XE are, are getting it as well. ACI has a RESTful API. Everything today should or is uh, getting, if not most of the devices that you already work with today have, uh, and pieces of software have a RESTful API that we can interact with. So let's take a look at a few of the methods in REST. The most common are GET and POST. Um, we also have PUT and DELETE. There are a number of other methods, probably about 20, that don't really get as much attention or as much use. So Cisco normally uses GET and POST and PUT and DELETE. Uh, and a lot of times you might even see um, well, actually, let's just go into these. So get, we're grabbing information. We're asking to retrieve or list information based on a URL. With post, we're typically creating something, okay? So we're creating a new entry in the collection. We are um, making a change. Uh, so post could do a update. Now, we can also post a delete as long as the body of our message says to delete. So sometimes we can do an HTTP delete and just list that top level, the URL, uh, essentially it deletes whatever that, that URL member is representational of. 
um, versus a post where we create the that top level resource, but the body contains all the configuration for that resource. Now, in for instance, for in, in ACI, we can even do a post, an HTTP post, that the body says, hey, here's the stuff, but by the way, the status is deleted. And so instead of doing an HTTP delete, we can update a lot of other stuff in a particular string or a, a particular type of entity or top level uh, domain. And everything is very hierarchical in a REST uh, data model, well, depending on what the, how the data model was written. But we could delete one small portion of that with a post. So these are some of the common methods that you will be using. And we'll talk about the tools that you can use, uh, open source, freeware tools, some are uh, standalone, uh, standalone applications for your Windows or Mac or Linux environment. Some are plugins to a web browser. Um, one of my favorites is called Postman. Uh, you know, like the Postman sends mail um, and it does HTTP post. It also, of course, does all the other methods as well. Uh, and you can, uh, it's, it's a Chrome plugin or a Chrome extension and you can use this uh, to make RESTful calls to any device, any, any type of application that supports REST. And you can even run it, uh, we'll show a little bit later, against something called Jetpacks or Collection Runner. And you can iterate over many, 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 many different lines to uh, delete a lot of stuff or add or create or update a lot of stuff. 